so we kind of think the, the questions we, we raised um, with three journalists now and one publisher. So we have Rebecca, um, who is deputy chief editor of the Wall Street Journal, something like the church of journalism maybe, uh, with a circulation of two million and one of these millions is digital already and with this ugly, ugly paywall thing, uh, which seems to be really successful. And we have Cindy, whose CV reads like the history of the Roman Empire, if you try to do research. So, so she, she's been everywhere. Martha Stewart, she founded Time Out in New York, managing editor of entertainmentweekly.com. She was um, chief editor of Com uh, Columbia Journalism Review and other things. And for half a year, you had a, the AOL homepage business. We, but we are not allowed to talk about that. <laughs> and now she's doing other things. Other things. We are not allowed to talk about either. <laughs> but you're consulting <laughs> Tina Brown, for example, yes. with, with her new venue. And we have yes. Jakob Augstein, who runs, uh, who's a publisher and um, runs Der Freitag, um, smallish. Uh, progressive weekly, progressive left wing. Well, let's call it left wing. Yeah. No, it's it's well, yeah. progressive left wing. Progressive. <laughs> and who's also by chance shareholder of another formerly known as Progressive Weekly, Der not, Spiegel. Not not. Uh, <laughs> which is still, a little bigger, but still a very good one, but not so left anymore. <laughs> And when I, when I uh, did some research about Eli, I thought about you all the time, because you have this kind of, you know, leftish topics that, that are hard to communicate on the net. For, and you, you established for the Freitag a kind of community-driven platform and all these things. So I thought a lot about how could you, or we, use uh, your models, uh, so Eli's models, to kind of push your topics. Do you think this would be a model for you? Yeah, but you are not so left-wing either, so I don't know if it no, fits for, for the side, but... We are smart. Yeah, um, <laughs> okay. That's easy to say. Um, but what we did when we started five years ago was to try to establish community journalism in Germany and to tear down the barrier separating uh, readers from, from uh, contributors, from regular journalists. And for us, that worked very well. But we are, as you said, uh, a niche product. I don't know whether the same recipe would work for a big paper like the Zeit. Mm. And, but I, I think what, what you really are asking me, and maybe you just didn't dare to formulate it that, that uh, harshly, is why, I, why, why we didn't do, do something like, like, yeah. like this, you know, yeah. like completely web-based. And, and, and do something. Yeah. Right, I tell you why. Headlines. I think that the Freitag still is uh, um, a, a very good way to burn money, uh, to be honest. But we are a growing paper. How much? Business? No, no. But, we, we, but we, we, we grow as a newspaper and, and we earn all our money with selling paper. So it's a very old tradition, old fashioned business. And when we started five years ago, this was uh, uh, the situation that we found. You can only earn money with selling paper. And now, in Germany, it's the same situation. So nothing really has changed. And, and it's very interesting for me to, 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 to hear to all these talks here and, and, and to, to see the people and listen to the discussions. But I always have a little bit the feeling that this is really an American debate. And for, for, for the German media scene, there might not be so much to learn from it, in, in, you know, because um, we still have the big newspaper houses, the big publishing houses like Boda or like, like Holzbring, Springer. And even if, if, if Springer uh, today makes a lot of his money in, in digital uh, business, it has nothing to do with journalism. So uh, uh, Boda makes a lot of money in digital business, but it has very little to do with journalism. But I'm interested in journalism, so, so I really have to, to, to sell paper to the people because uh, that's what they are paid for. Actually, we wanted to talk about journalism the next 30 minutes, so all the investors just leave, please, because we, we, we won't mention too many business models. Maybe one or two. So, so, do, so you tell me for Germany these models wouldn't no, work. No, I, I, I can't say about the future, but I, I can say about the present. Um, there is no money in it 
for selling journalistic content in Germany now. Maybe it's, it'll be different in five years, but I can't see it now. Mm. Cindy, so with your incredible career, um, can you kind of tell me if journalism works the Eli way in, in the future? Is this something we have to look deeper into? Um, I do think that what he's doing is really helpful. You for know all each of other us. very well, by the way. So well, we know each other, <laughs> and I do feel that uh, you know the one of the biggest issues that we're all facing is how do people even get through the sludge, you know, this incredible barrage of stuff that's coming at everyone every day, and I find it incredibly encouraging that Upworthy can only do a couple hundred stories because don't you find that we're all on the hamster wheel and constantly having to, you know, so that we become habit forming with our customers. You know, we're all, and also getting good Google ranking, we're all doing hundreds and hundreds of stories a day and most people aren't reading them. And also we're all barraged, you know, we need help getting through, finding the signal and the noise and, you know, also, the advertising model, sorry to go into the business models again, but you know, that stops working when everything gets that fragmented. Mm. So you are with the Wall Street Journal in a kind of, I, I, I call it a church in a strange world, you're kind of outlier compared to the rest of the market. We, we talked yesterday about, you, you told me, I think content is coming back. I hear that for the fifth time maybe in history, <laughs> but it's right, we are realizing that too. So people pay attention to deep reporting suddenly, how, how come? Oh, absolutely, I feel that in the past year or so there's been just renewed attention to the importance of, of content and original content. Every day at our morning news meeting, we, we are a paid site and I realize that may not be incredibly popular in the room, but um, we look at which stories have generated the most orders. and. Um, Reporters and, and editors feel really good when your stories, you know, basically had enough of an impact that someone is going to pay to read it. Um, and I think that a pay model in journalism is, uh, we've always been pay. I kind of wish in a way that some of our rivals had become paid earlier. I think the whole course of journalism may have been changed, but at the end of the day, we do need to make a living. Um, and I would agree with Eli that, you know, whether it's Syria, a series we just did on lobotomies of veterans after World War II that had a lot of video, was very immersive. These are our most read stories consistently. And it does give me great optimism to, to look at the future. And I've also been interested to see BuzzFeed hire an investigative editor, to see Marissa hiring columnists. And um, I have friends who are freelancers who are suddenly very busy. So I'm, I'm feeling that um, whether you're the Wall Street Journal or or really any content purveyor, if you can do something that's scoopy, exclusive, compelling enough, you are gonna find readers. Mm -hmm. Another thing we, we kind of see every day though is that we're lucky enough to have the front page of a newspaper, and this may sound like a throwback, but um, consistently the stories that are on our front page are among the most traffic stories, and I think that readers are craving um, some sort of curation, some sort of order in which we can put the world. And, and Nick um, spoke about this this morning um, in his quest to put definitiveness to the news. And on WSJ.com, on the on the on the website, today's news is one of the most popular features because people still really want to know what we put on our front page. Why do we need journalism? Sorry. Why do we need journalism? Well, we need it for the same reason uh, that we've needed it uh, for the last, I don't know, 200 years or so, to curb power. Well, that's my, my reason in being in this, in this profession. I think uh, our job is to curb power where, wherever it uh, occurs. And, um, and this job has gotten more difficult, I think, in the last uh, couple of years, because there are big power clusters hiding in, in places where you couldn't uh, uh, see them before so and and what I'm really so I'm really worried about the institutional foundation of this of this job you know and um, and I, I, I do believe in the internet and in all these projects because they are just great but for me they are interesting only in that point when they start to to, to criticize power and um, as I said before, I think in Germany and in Europe, we still have the great, uh, the, 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 the big institutions, the big papers who do that job. And, and up to now in, in the internet, you don't see anybody really who can do that job. I mean, the, so, so uh, uh, 
the reason for being in journalism hasn't really shifted in, 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 in the last couple of years. And, yeah. and, and the question that we have to ask ourselves is how these institutions will be able to survive um, the changing structures on, on the readership side and on the advertising side. So, so I, I, I'm talking about business, but, but in, in effect, what, what bothers me is how, how we can fulfill our task. Mm. So Eli had a great talk on, on the TED conference in 2011. You have to check it out if you didn't see it already. And he mentioned, so actually, uh, journalism and told us that, remember that kind of the ethical thing in journalism just started 1915, 1920, when editors started to think about ethics at all. Um, so I have the fear when I see what you are doing and what's happening at the moment um, that this may be just an historical error. So journalism is just a phase, a transition, and it will go away and you are the outlier. I think that readers need sources of news that they can trust. And we see this whenever there's a breaking news story, that people flock to our site. Um, we're very proud of the fact that uh, we're the most trusted newspaper brand in America. Um, and I totally agree in terms of accountability and our role in accountability. We're proud of the role we played with the Chris Christie um, bridge uh, scandal. Um, and we had a reporter who consistently wrote stories about that all fall and was mocked by uh, Governor Christie. And, uh, you know, these are, uh, these are topics that are really important to readers and are built up over time. I would say in a breaking news situation, um, lots of times things that are out there on social media are not right. Mm. And we are incredibly careful, um, and I know other news organizations are, in getting it right so that you know what you read um, is correct. And, and I think that's one of our, our most fundamental goals and one of the reasons that amid everything else, you do need you do need news organizations that are established and can help sort through the facts. Mm. Let's take, uh, for example, the, the, the Greenwald debate, because we, we stumbled over that uh, some, some weeks ago. You had it in the US, I think, in summer, and the Wall Street Journal had a kind of rather complicated role in this kind of, the, so you are kind of bitchy when, when we touch the, the Greenwald topic, because, um, so it, it's, it's really, it's really a, a, complex, a complex debate boiled down to the question if he's a journalist or not, or if he's um, compliant to all the basic principles of journalism. And I think, the so there's not the position of the Wall Street Journal, but I think you're not, you don't think it's reporting in, in the classical Wall Street Journal style of reporting. Well, I think there's a difference between advocacy journalism and, uh, you know, the traditional uh, news gathering that, that we and others do. I mean, I have a lot of respect for Glenn Greenwald and, and the attention that he's given to the privacy issue over the past year. We at the Journal tend not to do partnerships, so we didn't do a partnership with him that other news organizations did, but we have... Um, done very groundbreaking work on the issue of privacy uh, over, over several years of the What They Know series, and we're very committed to the topic, and we're actually um, uh, very proud of the stories that we did without the Snowden documents. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I think that these are decisions that we have to make, but, uh, but uh, you know, journalism, um, you know, is not necessarily, you know, advocate, there's certainly a place for advocacy journalism, but there's a place for traditional journalism to sort out the facts and to present both sides of the story, which is very critical. Mm. Actually, he's an, a good example for another thing happening for 10 years now, but now it's really, an, it has another other quality. Walt Mossberg left, the Wall Street Journal doing his own thing. By the way, you were responsible for kind of replacing Walt with a new, Portal, Wall Street Journal Digital, how it's going? Thanks, we just launched a couple weeks ago, WSJD, and um, we, we um, had a very good relationship with Walt and Kara over years and, and just parted ways uh, uh, um, three months ago, and I think a lot of people felt that we couldn't really you know, do something so quickly. We're not really seen as a fast-moving organization, but we really scrambled uh, within those three months to launch a site. We've hired 20 tech reporters around the world, and one of the things we're doing at the Journal right now is basically launching a number of startups going deep and long in, in some key areas, mm. tech, central banking, M&A, Washington, um, and we're trying as best we can. We're not a tech startup, but to inculcate a startup culture
culture. Um, and like any journalist, I mean, a, a, a deadline was a very clarifying thing. Mm. So we're hopeful um, that we can, you know, we have 1,800 journalists around the world, and now with a renewed emphasis on tech, that we can bring a unique global perspective to a subject that is, that is just reshaping everything mm. so fundamentally. So Glenn Greenwald kind of did, do, does a new thing with uh, money of Pierre Omidar, the, the eBay founder. We talked about that. Uh, and Ariana is the role model. Sullivan, Nate Silver, and Tina Brown. And you are consulting Tina. So is this a new kind of thing? So if you are uh, renowned enough, you do your own thing. And maybe you are an activist more than a journalist. You do a, you're, you're trying to create an upworthy kind of project or doing conferences and stuff like that. Um, two points there. I don't think you, we should get hung up on the labels necessarily of journalist or not, because I think as long as, I mean, think of all the bloggers who end up breaking news and then getting, you know, brought into the fold in some way, um, like Greenwald, you might even say. Uh, I think there it's, it's just mostly that transparency is the key. It's also the key with all of the new sponsored content and all those dilemmas. I don't know if you have that as much in Europe, but we certainly deal with this all the time mm -hmm. about whether you know something is labeled as it's it's written as if it's an article and it looks it walks and talks like an article, but it's actually advertising. And mm -hmm. to me, it's all about just being clear where it's coming from and not misleading your audience, or they won't trust you to come back to the other word. Um, and otherwise, I think it is sort of what does the audience want from the journalist they trust? And to some extent, I think that's why you see people going off on their own, because this, the conference businesses are springing up because people want to come hang out with their tribe of the person they trust to tell them things mm. and meet other people who feel that way and have a memorable experience. And, you know, it's like when I was a kid, um, concerts were incredibly cheap and recorded music was expensive. <laughs> and the same kind of thing is happening in our business, I think. And you see all kinds of media companies doing it and, and individual people too. Mm. L let me say something about Upworthy because we were talking about this and, and, and Eli is here. Uh, I just read that, that the success of Elizabeth Warren, yeah, this the Democratic senator from Massachusetts, was due in part of, of her very successful viral self-marketing via Upworthy and, and via other uh, uh, social networks when she was questioning banking regulators in the Senate and so on. And, and she had the Senate race and, and, and they spent like, I don't know, $70 million or so for, for that race and it was more than, than any time in history before and I don't know. But, but the whole idea is that this whole process works so different in the US than here because politicians, they don't raise money here for their uh, uh, election campaigns and they don't do self-marketing in social media. So in the US, um, well, yeah, but not, not half as uh, much, uh, well, yeah, exactly. So in the US, uh, uh, um, a website like Upworthy can really play a vital part in, 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 in politics and it can have an effect and because people use it and, and, and what the editors of Upworthy choose might have an effect on outcomes of, of, of political decisions and so on. But I don't see this happening here. I just don't see it happening. And if I look uh, uh, over the past years, I, wouldn't, I couldn't really tell why this should change in a foreseeable future, because the, the structures are so different. And, and I think this is a, an experience that, that you had before when, when Gruner and Jahr, the big publishing house, um, went to internationalize and they went to France and, and they sent all their guys over to France, you know, to develop the market. They brought all their know-how with them, how to, to you know, to, to bring papers, to print them and to bring them to the selling point. But the papers themselves, they couldn't be exported from Germany to France. They had to develop it there on the spot because it's really a cultural thing. And, um, and this goes the same even today in the globalized uh, digital area. I think you mentioned um, content, um, 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 native advertising. Yes. So, so your it's editor, Gerard Baker, yeah. he said something great. He said Netverti native advertising is a Faustian pact. So the Wall Street Journal will never do that. I realize that even the New York Times is considering doing something like sponsored content. Why don't you? Why don't you? Yeah, we we. Um, 
definitely have reservations about native advertising. I think your point about clarity and transparency to the readers is, is so important. And it gets right back to the trust issue. But we, we are tiptoeing in. Um, you are? We are. Um, so tell us about that. <laughs> well... <laughs> <laughs> Well, on, on, our, uh, on our new tech site, um, uh, in ways that are, oh. that are um, in a stream that are clearly advertised, we are, you know, tiptoeing into this. We are, as Jerry said, uh, Aren't you very responsible for the tech site? Yes, but not yeah. on the, I'm not responsible for the advertising. Okay. So how do you do that <laughs> without kind of corrupting your... Trust. You need to be very careful about clearly identifying and labeling it. And, and I mean, there are, there are people doing very innovative things with native advertising. Um, we, like many others, are looking at them, but we're, you know, we're treading very carefully. I mean, at the heart of this is the reality that digital advertising is not nearly as profitable as we once wanted it to be. Um, and uh, uh, print advertising for us is still far more lucrative, and we're lucky we we have um, a healthy, you know, kind of surprisingly healthy print operation. And, but we have to be really careful that in the pursuit of, of ad dollars that we do not blur these lines that are so important. So we're, we're tiptoeing into mm. some new, and stay tuned for more, but, but we're going to be very cautious. Mm. Uh, I just got a sign that we have, have eight uh, more minutes uh, present from DLD. So it may be possible if you have questions for Eli or for our other panelists, we pass around the mic and you can think about it in the next minutes. Um, you mentioned in an interview that, so it's you, you, yes, you yes, mentioned, yes, yes. Jakob Augstein yes. mentioned in an interview, so you see as another model for journalism in the future would be something like a foundation paying for it, like ProPublica maybe in the US or something like that. Do you really think that? Is that, is that a model for the future? So but that's the last line of defense. Journalists like Glenn that's Greenwald. really, it's the last line of defense. I mean, if the, the last surviving journalist might turn to a foundation and ask, okay, come on, help me. I, I don't know how to get along anymore. I really do hope that uh, we will be spared from this model uh, here. And I really do hope that the big uh, publishing houses find a way to survive. Um, well, that's my own interest because I, I own a small publishing house and we want to grow and, and, and survive. But I think it's, the importance is that, that you have to have institutional independence to, to really do that job. And if you're dependent on, an inst on the foundation, you're still dependent, even if it's all the all-well-meaning foundation, you know. So another publisher who tends to be at this conference every year, Hubert Burda, has a question. <laughs> I'm old enough for not putting questions. So just to do some uh, remarks on the business side. Um, if you look to the newspapers, newspapers in the future, traditionally you had three very profitable things, real estate, cars, and employment. They are all gone. They are gone. There's no more revenue. The Süddeutsche had 130 pages employment every Saturday. When you walk through Schwabing, you could see it on the um, Abfall, lagen Sie drauf. My, <laughs> it's a bit German and English, you know. And a lot of money, it's gone. 12 pages, where are they gone? To Xing. Why haven't they bought Xing? The car industry has got to, to Autoscout. And Emo's card, you heard about the price, two billion, maybe three billion. So that's very difficult for the business model of newspapers. And uh, FZ says we lost money. About the Süddeutsche, I don't say anything because they don't publish. But I constatiere that they have sold their radio business for probably 30 million, which is more or less the loss, I guess, they have done last year. Now coming to Focus Online, which is a kind of unloved baby by the Qualitätsjournalisten. I tell you <laughs> why Cullen and me, we changed it. It was about 2002 or three. I went to see the nice guys from Google in Hamburg. Uh, what is his name? Uh, he's now the boss in, no, 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 not Mikesh. Uh, Schindler, Schindler or Schindler? Philip. And he said to me, oh, Mr. Burda, wonderful to have you. Focus is number one in revenues. 
I said, how much money we get paid from you? He said, it's number, the place number one, 3.8 million. I said, Mr. Schindler, my editorial costs are 32 million. This is not a, this is, <laughs> this is not a good business. And there, where we changed, where we changed the business model, and now you see focus online is on the stock exchange, about more or less 300 million. Why? Because we have holiday check in it. And we have elite partner at Yameda. You cannot live just with quality journalism on the web because there is no revenue business from advertising and all the hopes about uh, paying content, being as a bizarre content which Mr. Döpfner has, are very optimistic. I, I mean, uh, Bill said on two millions on paper. I don't know, 140 on, on the net. So this is a, a complicated business model. So that's why, why we went the other way with uh, Focus Online. And if we can get another thing into our Focus Online, which the, the, the online business is a kind of trailer to other content. That's, that's very simple. If you don't say it's quality journalism, I have nothing against it. I can live with this because we cannot lose money. Thank you. <laughs> so you don't have anything against quality journalism. So one comment here, one comment here. No, it's not a comment. It's, it's, it's more uh, a question uh, to you because you are somebody who might really be in a position to answer it. Um, what you are actually saying is that quality journalism to survive has to be uh, subsidized by other income sources. But there might come a time when uh, a big um, publishing house finds itself in a position where it says, well, uh, we earn so much money from, I don't know, partnership and, and, and uh, uh, tr no, internet trade right. and everything. What do we need those darn journalists for? They, they, they only cost money. And this will be the moment when, when maybe uh, when, when the great publishing figures have left the, the stage, when some accountant says, well, we, we cut the crap and then it's over. financed by these kind of holiday check or stuff like this, but that's gone, that's gone. We'll probably never come back. Now, as a publisher, as a verleger, you have to think, what is the business model? I cannot see uh, a subventioniert business model. That's why I do the Petraka Award, which is totally subventioniert, and it makes a lot of fun, and you know, you have no troubles, nothing, but uh, as a publisher, there must, be, there must be revenues, there must be a profit, otherwise it doesn't work. And um, uh, to be, vielleicht zu, erzähle ich Ihnen zu viel, but I think, I think the best for the moment being is this Handelsblatt. And if you want to know my position, read what Jakob said last week about online, about the apps, and what I have done, I, I subscribed for 60 euros this Handelsblatt a month. I get it online every morning, I get the app two, three days a week, and I get the Handelsblatt uh, on the web. And this will probably be the model for Focus 2, because you cannot sell only the magazine on Monday or, or Saturday, you have to sell it two, three times a week. And, uh, uh, I think this Handelsblatt is really cutting edge. Compliment, I think where here is, but this is, this is the best model and, and this really can work. So, das war zu viel. Danke, wiederschauen. I think I can pass the information that the whole spring universe I'm part of didn't pay Hubert Burda for this ad. So, last words. 
it could be slightly different in the U.S., but for us, um, I hesitate to say that print is, is totally dead. Our Saturday circulation is actually increasing, and we launched a real estate section two years ago, a print section. People thought we were crazy, and many, many uh, weeks now, it's 18 pages and ha is full of ads. So I think in spots, particularly in curated form, even if it's once a week, people are finding uh, space for print. I'd also say that digital is... Uh, as, as front and center as it can possibly be. Um, in December, uh, mobile traffic, we haven't talked much about mobile directly, but it was more than a third of all visits to our homepage. And this is a radical change that I think we're just beginning to grapple with. Um, and I think it's really interesting to see. Uh, I just saw a stat that this past year, um, digital revenues for magazines in the US were double what they were a few years ago. So it was. Okay, it's still digital dimes to print dollars, but it's at least 20 cents instead of a dime, one dime. Um, but I do think that both for, for print advertising in the US and also TV advertising, we're just at the very beginning of even more crazy disruption because the ad selling machine is still very elaborate. I mean, they've already downsized the journalists radically, right? We've cut way, way back on the content side of things, but the, the I've, I don't know if this is true at the journal, but in most of the big media companies I know, the, the business side is still pretty, shall we say, to use the cliche, robust. And I think that disruption is still coming. So I promise that next year on the media panel, we won't talk about business models. <laughs> thank you for- Good luck with that. Thank you for engaging. Thank you. Thank you, Eli. Have a nice time at DLD. Thank <laughs> you.